Everybody done all right? Yeah. Yes. So we got the kingdom of God's beloved Son. We had entrance by birth of the Spirit. We have a new status in Christ. And a future physical reality, we will be received up in glory when the Lord returns. And there will be the harvest that takes place. So are you with me so far? Yeah. It's all, I don't even know why you all have me here. Just, uh, oh, we're understanding it better than better. That's right. Is everybody back now? Is everybody we're missing? <clears throat> well, I guess we need to go back and take a look at how this mess happened, huh? Why there was such a need for all this. You all know in Genesis 1, 1, we read it last night, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Are we on? Then there was a mess that took place, right? It became without form and void, darkness upon the face of the earth. Then the Spirit of God moved and He had to reorder all those things. He had to put them back in a functioning, working way. So He did that. God said, and so it was. God said, and so it was. And those are your seven days that we talked about. I just want to take a look at one of them, and that's when he put man together. You've got two separate records about it, one in chapter 1 and one in chapter 2. And there's a reason for that. God, uh, let's see. He says in verse 20 on the fifth day, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature, the living creature that hath life, soul life, the fowl that flies above in the earth, open firmament in the heaven. God created great whales, every living creature that moves, which is brought forth abundantly out of the waters, after their kind, every winged fowl after its kind, God saw that it was good. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the waters and the seas. Fowl. <coughs> Let fowl multiply in the earth. Evening and morning were the fifth day. So he made soul life. Go to chapter 2. And this is like, meanwhile, back at the ranch. <laughs> and he gives us added information for what he... I'm going to save that verse in 28, what he did. And he's again talking about man, but this time not in relationship to those days, but in relationship to their generations. He says in verse 4, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created the day the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Every plant of the field before it was in the earth, every herb before the field it grew. The Lord hadn't caused it to rain yet. There wasn't a man to till the ground, but the one a mist from the earth watered the face of the earth. Verse 7, Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the what? Breath. Yeah. Breath of life. Man became a nephish guy, a living soul, just like fish, just like birds, just like animals. They all had that in common. As a matter of fact, I think it's Psalm 49. I know it's in the Bible. I think it's Psalm 49. It says, no difference between the beast of the field and you. Is that Psalm 49? I think it is. You can look at it. Maybe it's Ecclesiastes too. But there's no difference between man and the beast of the field, but perish. That's the point. What does mortal mean? Subject to death. That's why this body of humiliation we got came about. But let's go back over here. Man had a body which God formed out of the elements of the dust of the earth. He made soul life. He became a living soul. So that's, he became a living soul with the breath of life. Right. So when man breathes his last breath, he dies 
corrupts and goes back to the dust of the earth. Right? That's why in Philippians 3 it talks about this vile body. Because it's subject to that humiliation that Adam brought upon us. But let me show you in chapter 1 how he speaks of him initially. And he speaks of him totally different than from a body and soul perspective. It says in 125, God made the beast of the earth after its kind, or genus, cattle after their kind, or genus, and everything that creeps on the earth, all creeps after their genus. <laughs> God saw that it was good. That was a joke. Okay. Verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now we've already read what God is, right? He is holy and He is spirit. He's the Most High God, everlasting, no beginning, no end, all of that. Let's make man in our image. Not like the beast of the field who had soul life. And he puts it in a heterosis, heterosis figure of speech, which is an exchange of accidents. Talks about God as in the plural. Like a golfer was a what kind of round did you have today, Jason? Well, we had a good day. You know, or the king says, we the king, or we the queen, or, the, or whatever. You know, famous people talk about themselves in the third person plural <coughs> for their majesty. <coughs> it's a figure of speech. And I, um, what did I say? Heteros, etc. And let them have what? Dominion. Dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over cattle, over the, all the earth, over every creep that creeps on the earth. So God, now look at this, created man in His image. God is what? Spirit. In the Spirit. Then it repeats it. And the image of God created Him. So that's also a figure. Anybody have it written down what it is? God created man in His own image and the image of God created He Him repeats the same same thing in an inverted order. And I should have written it down, but I, it's escaped me. You can look it up in Bollinger's Figures of Speech. I picked up the wrong Bible. It's not in my margin. Inverted. Inversion. No, it, it's, uh, I think it starts with A, not Anadiplosis. Yeah, Anadiplosis. It's just like He says over here in Genesis 1, <laughs> Verse, verse uh, 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth became. The emphasis falls on the repetition of that word. God created man in His own image, and the image of God created he Him. It's on the image that the emphasis falls. Male and female created He them. Now you've got another figure called repetitio. He repeats it three times in the same sentence. That's not normal, is it? So that's beyond grammatical form, which intensifies what he's saying. He created it! You get it? What did he do? Created man in his image. And there's another figure, and I forget what it is. One is the antidiplosis. One is repetitio. There's another one in there, too. Huh? Is that how you say it? What's that? Down, verse 28, P-R-O-L-E-P-S-I-S. -E what is it? I mean, what's the figure? From the actual building of Eve, not to, I don't know. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Just as verse 28 is prolific. Oh, there's another one in 27, too. I should have brought my notes from it, but I don't think I have it. Anyway. So anyway, God created man in His image and He gave him dominion over the world. Somewhere I had that written down. Everything's kitty walkers here. Psalms talks about it. He put him over the works of His hands. Gave him all the dominion. And we know that when Adam sent, He gave him commandment in 2.17. Right? Lord God said, it's not good man should be alone. 
I'll make a help meet for him. Now, well, back it up 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Well, we know that his body and soul existence went on to live, what, 900 years? Where is that? Uh, and he had sons not in God's image anymore, but he had sons in what? His own image. What is it, chapter 8 or something? No, chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him, male and female created he them, and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness, after his image. He was no longer in the image of God. The days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years. And he begat Seth, sons and daughters, and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. But God told him the day he disobeyed, he would surely die, right? Toyo, is that the Hebrew? That day he would die. Something died. Look at Romans 5. Sure, you all know this. Just bear with me. In Romans 5, God explains all this to us. Romans 5:12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and in the Greek it has the before it. And whenever you have the in Greek, it's unique. It's different than English. We use it as a definite article. They use it to distinguish something that's totally unique. Uh, and it will refer back to it at times as the sin because it's the one over here in Adam which was made known. The death because it's the one that came from Adam. So you just don't take it uh, lightly. So sin in the, came into the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all men for that all sin. Where? In Adam. Because we're of his offspring. His sons were born in his image. Not God's. God created him in his image. But when he had sons, they were born in his image. They no longer had spirit life. So through the work of Christ, you see everything that Adam did and everything that Christ did summarized here in 512 to 21. You don't occur anywhere in here. Only Adam's work and Christ's work. So we read through verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the world and sin didn't count it, imputed, imputed or reckoned it's not counted where there's no law you know what the, when you break the law it's called a trespass then that sin becomes criminal in nature the law made sin criminal in nature verse 14 nevertheless death reigned from Adam to Moses even over them that had not sin after the likeness similitude of Adam's transgression who is the type of him that was to come speaking of Jesus Christ but not as the offense Adam's so is the free gift for if through the offense of one Adam's many be dead much more the grace of God and the gift by grace which is by one man Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many and not as it one by one that sin Adam so is the gift for the judgment the judgment the judgment was by what Adam to condemnation but the free gift is out of many offenses unto what justification, justification. isn't that something just the reverse order Adam began his time with the Spirit of God in paradise with dominion. Jesus Christ began his life in a manger, in a stable, 
and didn't have the Spirit of God till he was 30. And yet, he redeemed us. He believed what God said and when he began his ministry, fulfilled every word of his promise. Not bad. Wow. I can't imagine God sitting in heaven during this time. <laughs> wow. Verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive, lambano, the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one what? So the, that reign in life is restored. It's going to be restored. Therefore, verse 18, as by the offense of one, Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. That's that condemnation of sin and death. We were born with just a body and breath life. We had to be born again to receive that spirit and to have access into God's realm again, into His kingdom. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so, by one righteous act, the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, Adam's, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of the one shall many be made what? Righteous. Moreover, the law just kind of entered in beside the offense so that it could abound. It didn't deliver man from sin. It showed him how deep in the ditch he was and that there was no way out. It made him guilty before God. I got a homework assignment for you. In the book of Romans, I want you to look up the 80 times the law is spoken of. 80 sometimes, I think. Look them up. See what the law did. Made all men guilty before God. Was there any righteous? Nope, not a single one. All guilty before God. Jew and Gentile alike. The law didn't deliver anybody because nobody kept it. And it made the sin a criminal offense and made them guilty of the wrath of God. That's what they deserved. And yet in spite of all that, God turns around and in Christ freely gives us all things with Christ. The Holy One, <coughs> Everlasting One, Most High God One, Daddy, our Father. The law came in just to show them how guilty they were. The offense abounded. But where sin abounded, God's divine favor did much more. It superabounded. That is, the sin reigned unto the death, even as might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So he told us the end from, I gave you the end from the beginning. Let's go back over to Genesis. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? We didn't deserve a lousy thing. We were dead in trespasses and sins. But He quickened us. He made us alive together with Christ. When we were dead in sin, we had no spiritual life. But He made us alive in Christ. What's it say? 1 Corinthians 15, 51 or so. Babe, Christ became a life quickening spirit. First man was of the earth, earthy. The second man, the man from heaven, became a life-giving spirit. Isn't that wonderful? And who gave it? He did. He gave it to them. They manifested. They received and manifested. Now, anybody who confesses Jesus Christ as Lord believes God raised Him from the dead, begotten from above, enters the kingdom, and they've got the hope of that actual physical presence there in the future. Well, go back to Genesis 3. See what comes up here. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Who's the serpent? It's the, the word Nakish. N-A-C-H-A-S-H -A -A in the Hebrew. And 
the brown, new brown driver, Briggs Jacinius, says crafty tempter. This rest record tells us the serpent was more subtle or crafty than any beast which is any created being of the field. This created being mentioned anywhere else in the Word. We read about him last night. Revelation chapter 12, I read you verse 9, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceives the whole world was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him, which were a, a third of the angels of God. <coughs> so this serpent is the devil or Satan. The devil means slanderer. That's what the word means. In Ezekiel, we read about him. From my Ezekiel, In verse chapter 28, verse 12. The second part of the verse says, Thou sealest up the sun. You with me? Ezekiel 28, 12b. Thou sealest up the sun. You with me now? How wise was he? Full of wisdom. How beautiful was he? Perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. So this serpent is getting described to us. He was more wise than any being of the field and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now look how he was dressed. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee and the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. And we read in Genesis 3, go back there, said he was more subtle or wise than any created being of the field which the Lord God had made. The revelation here tells us he was full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Eve wasn't deceived by a snake. This is who she dealt with. Not a mythical snake, but a glorious spirit being. He was God's anointed cherub that covered. The word covereth is S-A-K-A-K -A -K in the Hebrew. It means to cover as the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. Covered. <clears throat> Lucifer dwelt in the true holy places after which the earthly one was designed. The covering cherub was the serpent of Genesis 3. He was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty and he trafficked in evil and was filled with violence when you read the rest of it. Ezekiel 28. The Word of God clearly identifies him. The Scriptures unveil him to us, his person, his motives, his abilities, and character. The same Spirit came to Jesus in the wilderness. The Word of God identifies him as the tempter there. The devil and Satan. He even quoted Scripture to the Lord Jesus out of its proper context, of course with the motive to tempt. He knows the Word of God, but instead of using it to minister deliverance to people, as he's corrupted his wisdom, he uses it to deceive and oppress people with it. The same words that came out of God's mouth. He tries to turn it on you. He tried to turn God's Word against God's Son. And he did the same thing to Eve in Genesis chapter 3. This is his realm we're dealing with. The record in Matthew 4, 8, and 9 reveals that all the kingdoms of the world are under his authority. Take a look at it. Matthew. It's also in Luke 4. 
Matthew. So he's tempting the Lord Jesus in verse 3. The tempter came to Him. Matthew 4, verse 3. If thou be the Son of God. Well, it tempts us a lot with that too. I don't know about you, but... Well, if you're really who you think you are, how come you're not out there doing something greater than you're doing? How come nobody listens to you? You're no Billy Graham. Verse 4. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And the devil takes him up into the holy city, sets him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, Oh, if you're the Son of God, throw yourself down commit suicide, for it's written. He'll give his angels charge concerning thee, and in your hands they'll bury thee up, and lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. The devil takes him up to exceeding high, high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said, All these will I give thee if thou wilt. What? Fall down, fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, Go to hell. Get thee hence, Satan, for it's written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And then the devil split. Where did he get all the, the the power and the glory of the kingdoms of the world? They were transferred to him when Adam gave them away. Just like what's his face gave away his birthright for a cup of pottage. So then the kingdoms of the world came under his authority. The power of darkness. He corrupted His beauty and His wisdom and used it to over, try to overthrow God and to hurt His people. So there are two spiritual kingdoms. The one of the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the other headed by the God of this world who is the devil, Satan, the serpent, the prince of the power of the air, the so-called God of this world. You cannot detect spirit with your five senses. But make no mistake about it, the two spiritual kingdoms absolutely exist. You can see the effect or the result of their work from the senses, from the spiritual world, but you cannot see spirit. You cannot see, hear, smell, taste, or touch spirit, right? The Word of God reveals everything we need to know about spiritual matters. But because people are not educated by God's revelation, the serpent is able to orchestrate his realm of evil undetected and unknown to them. These same people usually blame the one true God for the work he does. As we read, he deceives the whole world. The serpent in Eden, the garden of God, was originally an angel of light who was full of wisdom, perfect in beauty, not a mythical talking snake. But the anointed cherub, of which Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 speak, he desired to be like the Most High God. He rebelled against God, and he tried to seize his throne. His own beauty corrupted him, and he arrogantly perverted his wisdom. Eve was literally dealing with a glorious spiritual being identified by the figure of speech, hypocatastasis, as the serpent. So there... That's the reason that he's introduced first as a serpent. Now the serpent was more subtle, 3-1-B, than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said you should not eat of every tree in the garden? I'm just going to have a little discussion with you. Let's just talk about it. Okay, we're friends. It's vital that we take note of the first recorded out words out of his mouth. Yea, hath God said? Extremely significant. He calls into question God's truthfulness, his accuracy, his validity, veracity, his reliability in an effort to deceive Eve so she would reject the word of God and forsake him. The serpent wanted Eve to take his word 
over God's. To believe what he said rather than what God said. His purpose hadn't changed. His primary purpose to this day is to get people to take his word over God's. If he can distort the word of God and seduce people to believe what he says, there's nothing to prevent him from deceiving a man or for that matter, the entire world. First, he asked Eve a question. His aim being to undermine God's word and cause Eve to doubt it. How did she respond? Haphazardly, lazily. The woman said to the servant, well, we can eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Left out the word freely. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, she added a word, neither shall you touch it. And then she turned the certainty of God's word into a contingency, lest you die. Do we any longer have God's word? Notice she left out the word freely, added, neither shall you touch it. Changed the certainty of God's word into a possibility, perhaps you die. If I changed what you said to this extent, would it still be your word? No. As a matter of fact, you might get quite upset with me for altering what you said. The serpent deceived Eve. She no longer held to the integrity, the veracity of God's word. And the serpent seized on the opportunity. Look at verse 4. And the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. Same thing we teach in the Christian church today. We're just going to pass right on into the afterlife. Mm -hmm. No Jesus Christ necessary. It's just normal. Just an evolution. <laughs> Somehow they, they go from the mud and the monkeys all the way to gain eternal life. Their evolution. It's just the next state of things. Just came out of a rock. <laughs> Who knew? <clears throat> Serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes are going to be opened. You shall be as gods, knowing good and evil, as though evil is going to really add to the good that God had showed them. <laughs> they didn't know death, didn't know sickness. They lived in paradise. All that God gave them was very good, and now the devil enters and he has finagled things to the place he's got her to question God's goodness. And through evil, make her wise. So there, there must have been more that took place than what's just written here. But at any rate, this is what is written here. <coughs> So the serpent's second recorded statement, you shall not surely die, completely contradicted what God said in 2.16 and 17. And every pagan religion embraces the belief of immortality of the soul in one form or another to this day. They teach that death is the door that leads to the afterlife. The foundation of the teaching of the immortal soul. Where does he go with this? You shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Let's see, God created them in His own image. He was the Almighty God, the everlasting God, the living and true God. Pretty good God we read about last night. Verse 131. God saw everything He made. Behold, it was very good in the evening and morning were the sixth day. The conclusion of God's work is marked with the word behold and the word acts as the figure asterismos to mark what follows with great emphasis. It's like you've got asterisks, behold and bold caps and exclamation points the rest of the line over. The conclusion of God's work to order the heaven and the earth to provide for man was behold, it was very good. Everything God did provide for man's home was to this end. It was well-ordered. It was rich, beautiful, prosperous, valuable, beneficial. Yet the serpent 
had the audacity to say that he could improve on God's work with the knowledge of evil. These statements by the serpent formulate the lie that perpetuates continually throughout man's history. The devil's primary sphere of attack is to distort God's word. Did God, is God really good? Is He really going to freely give you all things with Christ? Are you really the righteousness of God in Christ? Or are you just a piece of crap? You just screwed up again. <laughs> Well, who knows, Gerald? Who knows? When you die, you, you may not have been good enough. <laughs> you know what Joe says about you, don't you? <laughs> Isn't that unbelievable? The devil's primary sphere of attack is to distort God's Word today. That's his primary sphere of attack. And get us to question the validity, the integrity, the truthfulness of God's Word. You know what God says when He's going to create the third heaven and earth? He says, My Word is true and faithful, right, for so it shall be. That's the God that has the power to bring His words to pass. True and faithful. Nothing's really changed about His attack. So that which was very good, look at Romans 8. Romans 8. Romans 8. I'm going to read you this from Weymouth's translation. I think he does a good job. You can read it from your years you're working on. Romans 8, 19. This is what happened after Adam did this fell for it. All creation gazing eagerly as with outstretched neck is waiting and longing to see the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creation fell into subjection to failure and unreality. Parenthesis, not of its own choice, but of the will of him who so subjected it. End of parenthesis. Yet there was always the hope that at the last the creation itself would also be set free from the thaldrum of decay so as to enjoy the liberty that will attend the glory of the children of God. <coughs> For we know that the whole creation is groaning together in the pains of childbirth until this hour. And more than that, we ourselves, though we possess the Spirit as a foretaste of and pledge of the glorious future. Yet we ourselves inwardly sigh as we wait and long for open recognition as sons through the deliverance of our bodies. It is in hope that we have been saved, but an object of hope is such no longer when it is present to view. For when a man has a thing before his eyes, how can he be said to hope for it? But if we hope for something which we do not see, then we eagerly and patiently wait for it. I thought that's great work there. Great translation. I can't even read the stuff without crying anymore. <laughs> so this beautiful creation that God had put back together for His man and His woman, gets overthrown again. The glory of the first heaven and earth gets overthrown. God goes back to work. He reorders everything for His man. Why is the earth here? For God's man. Why are there heavens? For God's man. I'm not sure how many fields of science there are. Any of you knowledgeable? Electromagnetism. Astronomy. What do you call the study of rocks and all that stuff? Geology. 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 <laughs> Biology. <laughs> Physiology. Anatomy. Chemistry. Chemistry. Physics. Somewhere I wrote it down, a bunch of them. 
in a paragraph about like that. All those laws of nature and nature's God, by His wisdom, He set forth. Put them in motion perpetually and sustained them. Still does. By the word of His mouth. Unbelievable, isn't it? By His wisdom and by His power. And yet, man has the audacity to say there is no God. He's without excuse. He's just without excuse. What was the doctor used to always say? You want proof? Look at a tree. <laughs> Look in the mirror. It's really something. So here it all is. So we go back to Genesis 3. The woman saw the tree good for food, pleasant to the eyes, tree to be desired to make one wise, took of the fruit, offered it to her husband with her, he did eat too. Eyes of them both were open. Shazam! They knew they were naked. They are a nudist company. They grabbed some fig leaves, sewed them together, and made them aprons. First thing that happens is you see sin consciousness. Immediately. They try to cover themselves. They didn't need covering before. Next thing you see, they're afraid of God. They weren't afraid of Him before. Unbelievable. Yep, that wisdom really helped. We're getting more of His wisdom every day. Yeah. It says in Daniel before the end, people are going to go raving mad with knowledge. And I think it's increasing about every how many days now? Huh? Minutes. Hours now. It's doubling man's knowledge. Doubles every so many hours now. Doubles. Yeah, we can talk about artificial intelligence. Yeah, if you live to 2050, I just saw it. It's got to be true. I saw it on TV this week. You, you know, you make, make it to 2050, you're not going to have to worry about dying. They're going to have the technology boy just to string you up, put in new genes, correct all the problems with you, and just send you on your way. Oh, yeah, who the hell needs God, man? We're smart now. We're going to have AI too. You're not even have to work. We're figuring out now how they're going to Give everybody a salary because they're not going to be any jobs. All the AI is going to take care of it, you know. <laughs> we'll have a cashless society probably less than five years. You know that, right? Yeah. We're going to get a number and you just use that number, stick your hand. Boop, 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 boop. You don't even need a bank anymore. Why, you can even walk into Whole Foods already. You don't even have a checkout line. You have a number. They identify the number and you just walk on out with your basket and it's all taken care of. Boop, 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 boop. What's the company up with Wisconsin? Yeah, they've already put numbers in them. They do all their banking through it. 60% of the banks in Europe don't even carry cash anymore. It's all electronic. Yeah, we're wise. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. I'm ready. Bring it on. Get me out of here. <laughs> yeah, he's wise. His people are just like him. They are so smart. Just wonderful people. Unbelievable, isn't it? Well, it gets down here. God's having a little conversation with him. Cool of the day. <laughs> Adam and his wife looking for figs to hide behind, I guess. And the trees of the garden. Verse 9, Lord God... Called Adam. Adam! Where are you, son? Where are you? I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Who told you you were naked? Did you eat in that tree where I commanded thee? Thou shouldest not eat. Oh, the woman made me do it. The woman you gave me. The woman you gave me. <laughs> she gave me the tree and I, I ate the hell out of it. <laughs> the Lord said to the woman, what is this you've done? The woman said, serpent beguiled me. He deceived me. And I did eat. 
And the Lord God said to them, Because thou hast done this, you're cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field, and upon utter humiliation, your belly shalt thou go, and dust you'll eat all the days of your damn life. And I'm going to put enmity between thee and the woman. Doesn't say Adam. It says the woman. He's setting something up here. And between thy seed and her seed. Now wait a minute. I know that much. I was a bad student, but I know women don't carry the seed, do they? <laughs> Even somebody as bad in science as I am can do that. <laughs> so it puts it in a figure here for the person that that seed will bring. Who provided the seed of Jesus Christ when he was born in Mary's womb? God, God, God did. did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to bruise your head. Other texts say utterly crush your head. A lot of translations say crush, utterly crush. <laughs> but you're going to bruise his heel. And that's what's happening. Everything we're undergoing today is part of his kingdom, the kingdom of darkness. But there's your first prophecy of a Christ. The seed of the woman was the seed of divine conception that God conceived in Mary. He was born like the first Adam. God supplied the seed, no sin in him. He didn't come under Adam's sin, his condemnation. And yet he, who was without sin, gave his life for those who had sinned and died in our stead so that God could freely give us everything He achieved. It's unbelievable. <laughs> and that's most people's response to the whole scenario. It's just too good to be true. It's God's way. It's the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance. To change his mind from the natural disaster that it is to the carnality of his being knowing his by nature he condemns himself mm -hmm. and then embrace the goodness of God's divine favor that is that highly esteemed by God amazing <coughs> let's look at a little bit more about this this guy go over to Job <coughs> Remember, it's the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance. And here's Job, who was a perfect and upright man. He was stout in every way. Well, let's see. Verse 6. Now there was a day, chapter 1. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. There's another name. And the Lord said to Satan, Whence comest thou? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. He had free run, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on the whole earth. He's a perfect and upright man, one that fears God and is allergic to evil. He escheweth evil. He didn't laugh. I thought that was funny. <laughs> okay. Oh, shoot. Okay. Verse then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job, does Job fear God for nothing? Hast not thou put a hedge about it, about his house, about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands. His substance is increased in the land. But you just... You, you just stick forth your hand on him now and touch all that he had and he'll curse you to your face. You think you're so wonderful, God. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold! <clears throat> Look what follows. All that he hath is in your power. That kingdom of darkness, 
Only upon him put not forth your hand. So Satan went forth in the presence of the Lord. There came a day when the sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. Wine's good. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing, the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Well, that's how he made their living. Yea, they've slain the servants with the edge of the sword. So now he's murdered people. And I only am escaped alone to tell you. That'd be a sorry message to get, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. But on the heels of that, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Any of these things would be devastating. But this is one after the other. While he was yet speaking, there came also another, and so the Chaldeans made, made out three bands and fell upon the camels, have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in your eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they're dead. Your kids are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And Job arose and rent his mantle, shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshiped. And he said, Naked came out of my mother's womb, and naked I'm going to return. The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. And there came, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? Satan answered the Lord, and said, from going to and fro in the earth, walking up and down in it, just using my dominion. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that fears God and eschews evil? And still he holds fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without a cause. And Satan answered and the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, and all that a man hath, he'll give for his life. You stick forth your finger on him now. Move your hand. Just touch his bone of his flesh and he'll curse you to your face. The Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand. But save his life. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. I saw a person the other day that had boils all over their face. I can't imagine. I have a boil and it just hurts like hell. Imagine boils from the sole of your foot to the crown of your head. When I was 18, I almost died because I had... Uh, what was the name of that condition? I forget. I had ulcers from my mouth all the way out the inside. Ulcerative stomatitis. All the way. Temperature of 107. Told me if I lived, I'd be brain dead. Here I am. Explains a lot, doesn't it? I was in a tub of ice for three days trying to get my fever down. Before I passed out, I remember the doctor who came to our house in those days, and he was a friend of our family, he said, Alice, if he lives, it'll be God's work. There's nothing I can do. <laughs> he says, this temperature is 107. Two weeks later, I checked in for freshman football practice at East Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> I lost 30 pounds in two weeks. So they did the most loving thing on earth. They moved me to defensive end. <laughs> Two weeks later, I was first team cornerback. <coughs> anyway, a lot of things. Just 
Who does this stuff to people? Who tries to ruin their lives? Who who kills? Well, let me let me read you some of the other names Jesus Christ revealed about who he was. We've got Satan, the devil, the slanderer. He's called our adversary. We, he's called the serpent. He's the deceiver that deceives the whole world. He's the tempter. He's the murderer who was a murderer from the beginning. He's the father of lies. He's the thief that steals, kills, and destroys people, keeps them from being born again. He's the accuser of the brethren. He's the hinderer that thwarts God's purposes. He's the oppressor of people <coughs> with sickness. He's the imitator of the one true and living God. That's who we're dealing with. This glorious spirit being that God set over the work of His original ark the original throne who led up the worship of the heavens perfect in beauty and full of wisdom and through his own sin he arrogantly perverted it slandered God and deceived a third of the angels to follow him we refer them to them as devil spirits today or unclean spirits instead of holy spirits they are two-thirds more holy spirits which watch over the children of God plus we have access into the kingdom by birth and we have access by Holy Spirit to God himself and he exhorts us to utilize it with speak freely and have confidence and boldness so even though we live in this world in this kingdom of darkness that surround us, we're not of it. We can see the evidence of Satan's work everywhere you turn around. Mm -hmm. And there's coming a day he will have a man born of his seed that will sit on his throne as, as the false Christ, as the beast, and carry out all of his will with great fury. And it will be the worst time for the people of God on the earth at that time there's ever been since the beginning, or ever since. Thank God we've been delivered. So yeah, we suffer. Christ suffered too. Likewise, we will be glorified together with Him. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> wow. So, He has a lot of names too. There are, there are a whole page of names and syllabuses I'm sure you have. To talk about him from the Old Testament. But these things, Jesus Christ just pulled the covers back and let you look under the hood. And He showed you what's going on spiritually under His ministry. Light makes manifest. And He said, this is what's going on. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't need the Word I wish the time with that thing. Okay. Where am I going to read Reggie? Let's go back to Genesis 3. I want to give you the rest of this chapter here. And I can find the piece of paper I had it in Yeah. Jesus Christ said. He's the father of lies. There's no truth in him in John 8, 44. Identified him as the tempter. John 10, 10 is the thief who comes to steal, to kill, destroy. Has the power of death in Hebrews 2, 14. A murderer from the beginning. He murdered the whole human race. As well as God's only begotten son. The shameful spirit being the serpent, cunningly seduced Eve through his craftiness and convinced her to believe his lies instead of God's word. He got her husband to do the same and he did it. He knew what was wrong and did it anyway. What hast thou done? So God put enmity between the serpent 
who was the spirit being and the woman who was a human being. Enmity exists between adversaries. He put enmity between the seed of the serpent, which is a spirit seed, and the seed of the woman, who would be like Adam, a human being, the son of man. The seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, and this pronounces the ser serpent's utter defeat and end. Christ will accomplish this during his second coming to the earth. The serpent will bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, which foreshadows the death of Christ. However, God raised him from the dead, and looking back, we know this is referring to Christ. So here we have the conflict of the ages between God and the serpent, and between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. This changed the course of human history forever. God said that in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Now there was a need for a redeemer. But what did God say next to Adam and Eve? He lost them. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to your husband, and he shall rule over thee. Verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because you hearken to the voice of your wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face shall you eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and dust shalt thou return. Does that so sound like dying and going to heaven? <laughs> the creation fell into a state of ruin. It was cursed and brought forth thorns and thistles, which includes all kinds of noxious plants. The serpents lie and their disobedience even affected nature, which we read about in Romans 8, the current state of things. And isn't it interesting that the adversary turns all of this back on to man, not himself? And now man is going to heal the environment. Really? <laughs> really? So the Paradise Administration was ruined. Instead of a close functioning relationship between God and Adam, Adam was afraid of him. He hid from him. The day he disobeyed God's word, he died. He lost the spirit. The ground was cursed. He was sentenced to a life of labor and sorrow in the field, not in Paradise and he would return to the dust of the earth and physically die one day. Instead of being God's under ruler and having dominion over God's creation, there was also a radical change in the dominion that God had entrusted to him. I read it to you from Matthew, it's also in Luke 4. So the devil had the, the glory and the power of the kingdoms of the world and all he had to do is worship him and you can have it too. He said, that is delivered unto me. Adam handed over the dominion to the adversary. <clears throat> if the devil did not in fact have it, the Lord would have confronted him with the truth of his word as he did with other uh, temptations. Now let's see, before Adam disobeyed God's word, he only knew that which was very good, lived in paradise, which God abundantly furnished with all the necessary resources and much, much more. Adam began with an intimate relationship with God, created in his image, which was spirit, communicated spirit to spirit, was his under ruler on the earth and had dominion over the work of God's hands. Wasn't afraid of God, had no condemnation, no fear of God, had no sorrow, didn't know sickness or death. When he decided to take the serpent's lies and disobey God, he died spiritually, no longer endured a spiritual relationship with God, became afraid of him and tried to hide from him. We learned last night that's pretty futile since he, there's nowhere you can hide. He delivered his dominion in the earth over to the devil. The devil became the prince of the world. Nature changed, ground was cursed, became... Uh, brought forth harmful plants. Now Adam had to eat from the field, not from the bounty of paradise, which had been supplied for him. And it was going to require hard work, 
and sorrow till the day he physically died and returned to the dust. 3.20, Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. When they realized they were naked, they sewed together fig leaves, didn't they? God covered them with skins, which means there had to be shed blood, which pointed to the coming of a Redeemer by shed blood. And the serpent told Eve that they would be as gods. They'd be wise knowing good and evil, that they'd not surely die. How did that work out? <laughs> did the serpent's word prove to be the truth or the lie? Did the serpent's offer improve on what God provided Adam and Eve? Did the knowledge of evil make Adam and Eve like gods? Verse 22, The Lord said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. Again, heteros. And now lest he put forth his hand, take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. There's nothing else written, is it? Genesis 3, 20, 22 says, Behold, the man has become one of us. Had he in fact become like God? Nothing could have been further from the truth according to what we just read in the context. The opposite was true. What is stated is contrary to the reality that occurred. The word behold, again, acts like an asterisk to mark the gravity that followed. <laughs> When someone intends to express a sense opposite to the strict sense of the meaning of the words, it's irony. It's a figure of speech. The figure draws our attention to the serpent's lie in verse 5 and how false his claims were. Believing the serpent's lies resulted in tragedy for them. Their lives became a ruin, a disaster. And there's another figure at the end of the verse. And now lest you put forth your, his hand, take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. That's another figure of speech. It leaves us in suspense, stopping abruptly. The sudden silence is the use of the figure of speech. <clears throat> Aposiopesis. A-P-O-S-I-O-P-E-S-I-S. -S -S. The figure places emphasis on the unspeakable consequences should they eat of the tree of life. If Adam ate of the tree of life after the sentence of condemnation was passed, it would have made man's redemption impossible and his fate would have been sealed forever. He would have been unredeemable and without hope. Therefore, verse 23, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Quite a contrast to how they lived in paradise, isn't it? God drove Adam from the garden and placed spirit beings, cherubim, with a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way to the tree of life. A cherub is a powerful spirit be being such as the anointed cherub that covered they were there are other cherubs other than the serpent who is Satan or the devil. And they guarded the entrance so that Adam could not eat of the tree of life. <laughs> Quite something, isn't it? Well, the end of the story is that God's going to make all things new again. Right for the words of true and faithful. <clears throat> Christ is going to subdue all. But until then, we are in this kingdom of darkness, but we are no longer of it. We're in the kingdom of His beloved Son, God's beloved Son. And once He has fulfilled all, He's going to take His kingdom and give it to His Father. And His Father is going to make all things new again. But until then, we're in a wrestling match. And we'll get back to that later this afternoon. <laughs>